Our next session is entitled Gene Therapies in Taxia 101. Our presenter is Dr. Marie Davis. Dr. Davis is in, is in the Department of Neurology at the University of Washington in Seattle. And Dr. Davis has been seeing the patients with ataxia since 2012. Let's send it out to Seattle and Dr. Marie Davis. Hi, my name is Marie Davis. I'm a neurologist and I see ataxia patients at the Seattle VA and the University of Washington. My goal with this talk today is to give you a basic understanding of what gene therapy is and what strategies are being used. So before I get started, I wanna say that I have no disclosures. I'm not involved in any preclinical or clinical trials involving gene therapy or consulting for any biotech companies developing gene therapies. So just in the past few years, the development of gene therapies has brought newfound hope and excitement in treating neurodegenerative diseases that currently have no cure or treatment to slow the progression of neurodegeneration. A lot of my patients ask me about developments in these gene therapies. So I thought that this would be a good opportunity to give the background on how, it, how these therapies work. So before I talk about gene therapy, I wanna first make sure that we are all on the same page about what a gene is. Um, so I'll give some background on that. I will next talk about the strategies that are being used to develop gene therapies. And finally mention gene therapies that are already approved or in development for neurodegenerative diseases. So gen genetic information is inherited from both parents and can be thought of as the instructions that you were born with that make you who you are. These instructions are encoded in DNA and you can think of these instructions like an encyclopedia set. You actually have two sets of that encyclopedia, one that you inherited from mom and one from dad. You can think of a gene like a sentence in one of the pages within one of those encyclopedia books. So we have over 20,000 genes and each gene provides a message that instructs your cells how to build a protein. These are important because proteins make up the machines and structures that carry out the functions in every cell in our body and make us who we are. So continuing with this analogy, uh, we can imagine that um, this sentence, Seattle is a rainy city, is a gene that makes a protein. A mutation in a gene is an alteration of this sentence. For example, there could be a misspelling um, or a repetition or a deletion of part of the sentence or even a complete duplication of the entire sentence. And these are just a few examples of the many different possible alterations that can occur. These alterations can affect the instructions to make a protein and can lead to an abnormal or even absent protein. And this can sometimes lead to a disease such as ataxia. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, we inherit two copies of uh, the encyclopedia, one from mom and one from dad. And sometimes a disease is caused by a mutation present in only one of the two copies of the gene. This is referred to as a dominantly inherited disease. When a disease is caused by a mutation in both copies of the gene, it is referred to as a recessively inherited disease. So where are these genes actually located and how do they function? This is just a schematic of a cell, very simplified, uh, with the nucleus in the center. And genes are located in the nucleus and copy their instructions, which are sent outside of the cell, uh, I'm sorry, outside of the nucleus into the cell where machinery is located to make those proteins. So the goal of gene therapy is to stop disease causing instructions to be carried out in the cell in the hope that the disease can be avoided or halted. So I'm gonna go over the three main strategies now that are being developed um, for gene therapies. Uh, antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs, viral mediated gene replacement, and CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs are a synthetic molecule that can specifically bind to the gene of interest and lead to degradation uh, of that instruction to the cell. So you can imagine that the ASO in this 
and this analogy is this blue Seattle word, and it binds to our gene of interest, which has a, a mutation. It has a ex, um, repetition of uh, one part of the sentence, and then this leads to its degradation and no protein that is made from it. So ASOs block the uh, copies of the incorrect instructions that are sent to the cell to not make uh, that abnormal protein. Another strategy is to deliver the correct gene or a gene that can correct the incorrect instructions via a viral particle that is non-infectious. So the, uh, the, the advantages of this strategy is that we can take advantage of viral mediated delivery of genes into specific cells of interest, such as neurons. And it might allow this, uh, this delivery to just be a single dose. Um, uh, or, there are some challenges. Uh, so there can still be an immune reaction um, to the, the viral uh, particle that's used to deliver the gene. Um, and it is also uh, difficult to, to manufacture. So viral vectors would provide an additional correct instruction that would basically override the incorrect genetic instructions uh, that are present in the nucleus. And finally, I wanna mention CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. As this is in the news a lot, and I have patients often ask me about this, CRISPR-Cas9 is exciting because it allows us to specifically edit nearly every gene it is based on a mechanism that bacteria use to defend themselves against viruses. Genome editing with CRISPR-Cas9 requires a special molecule called a guide RNA that binds specifically to the DNA um, of the gene of interest. Once it binds to the DNA, this recruits the Cas9 protein, a bacterial protein, which can cut the DNA um, at its, uh, in the area that it binds to you allowing the introduction of a mutation or change in the DNA. Although, um, and so while, while CRISPR-Cas9 is widely used in research to specifically alter genes of interest in cells and animals in the laboratory, it is not yet um, applied for clinical use. And there are still a lot of major concerns for use of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in humans. It's uh, still un unclear how safe it is to alter the DNA in sperm or egg um, and uh, allow this you know, to, to be present throughout the uh, development. There's also the risk that gene editing could occur not just at the, at the gene of interest, but potentially in other sites um, um, of, the, of the genome or other genes. And additionally, the Cas9 protein is a bacterial protein that is foreign to us and could cause an immune reaction. But this mechanism um, of allowing specific editing of genes is very powerful and has a lot of potential. So CRISPR-Cas9 edits uh, the original instructions um, in the nucleus to make the right protein. So there are still challenges to developing gene therapies for neurologic conditions. Um, so the goal of um, especially antisense oligogene therapies is to stop production of abnormal proteins causing disease. But perhaps those proteins are important for other functions um, that we're not yet aware of and that could cause some long-term um, adverse effects that, that we, we have not yet uh, realized. Uh, another challenge is how to get the gene therapy to the right organ or, and or cell. Um, and that can be especially ch challenging with neurologic disorders where uh, the therapy needs to cross the blood brain barrier or even get to a specific part of the brain. And then uh, figuring out when is the best time to administer these gene therapies um, is also challenging, especially in adult onset neurodegenerative diseases, uh, such as many ataxias, 
where the disease process may start many years before clinical symptoms uh, become apparent. So here's a list of some antisense oligogene therapies that either are already available or in, um, in the pipeline for neurodegenerative diseases. It's not a complete list. There are definitely additional gene therapies in preclinical development, but I wanted to highlight a few on this list. First, the top three um, are already um, FDA, FDA approved and on the market. So those are for spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and familial amyloid polyneuro polyneuropathy. So although these are not therapies for ataxias, this is very exciting because it establishes uh, a precedent for this type of therapy uh, for neurologic conditions. And uh, they have been well tolerated and um, have had uh, very good clinical outcomes. The second is uh, there is an antisense uh, oligotherapy uh, for Huntington's disease that is in phase three clinical trials that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. And finally, uh, there are um, antisense oligos in preclinical development for spinocerebellar ataxia genes. So since Huntington's disease is due to a triplet repeat expansion, similar to triplet repeat expansions that cause several types of spinocerebellar ataxias, I wanted to highlight a few things about um, its development so far through phase three clinical trials. Um, so Huntington's disease, um, as I said, is, is due to a repeat expansion, um, and that's similar uh, to expansions in several of the most common spinocerebellar ataxias. Um, and this was uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, and it, it reported the results from phase two study um, of an ASO for Huntington's disease. So 34 um, Huntington's disease patients received various doses of this ASO um, targeted to the Huntington gene, and 12 received placebo. This was randomized. And uh, importantly, no serious adverse events were reported in any of these patients. Um, and this uh, ASO was administered uh, directly into this uh, cerebral spinal fluid four times over uh, 85 days. So this um, graph is showing that the higher the dose of the antisense oligo, uh, the lower the level of mutant Huntington protein um, that was detected in the cerebral spinal fluid. So um, this is showing that this antisense oligo is effectively decreasing the production of the abnormal um, Huntington's protein. And then even though the, uh, the main outcomes of this study were not focused on actual um, clinical uh, change in um, or a clinical um, you know, change in Huntington symptoms, a post hoc analysis did show uh, that there was a, a correlation with the um, dose of the antisense oligo and improvement in motor and cognitive function in um, uh, Huntington's disease patients. And so this is now in uh, phase three uh, clinical trials. So we don't have the results yet, uh, but it's very promising and I think really applicable towards a lot of, uh, towards therapies uh, directed to uh, spinocerebellar ataxias. So uh, viral gene therapies are also um, in, uh, in pipelines for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and I wanted to highlight it here as well that there is an FDA approved viral um, mediated gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. And there is uh, one for Huntington's disease that is in phase one um, trials. And there, is, uh, there are um, viral gene therapies in preclinical development for Friedrich's ataxia and spinocerebellar ataxia type three. Um, so I just wanted to show briefly, this is a study that was published in uh, last year that showed, um, uh, that used a mouse model of Friedrich's, Friedrich's ataxia 
um, and used an AAB mediated gene therapy that significantly improved the cardiac disease associated with this condition. So um, in green, these are the, the control mice. In yellow are the Friedrich's ataxia uh, mice uh, mouse model. And in blue are the Friedrich's ataxia mouse model that was treated with the AAB uh, gene therapy. And so you can see it, it did a really good job in terms of, in this case, this is a, a, a uh, their function on a treadmill, so an overall kind of cardiac function uh, measure. So in conclusion, um, I, want, I hope uh, I provided some um, background information that allows you to understand better uh, what gene therapy actually is and what it means. Um, so the goal of gene therapy is to correct the genetic instructions causing a disease. Um, and I uh, presented the three main uh, strategies that are being used in development of therapies, antisense oligos, which stop sending the incorrect instructions to cells, viral delivery to add back the correct instructions, and CRISPR-Cas9 um, genome editing, which edit and correct the original uh, genetic instructions. Um, there are already FDA approved um, uh, antisense oligo and viral mediated gene therapies uh, for spinal muscular atrophy. And clinical trials are in progress um, for both ASOs and viral mediated gene therapies for Huntington's disease. And preclinical studies are in progress for several spinocerebellar ataxias uh, and Friedrich's ataxia. So it's a really exciting time um, uh, and I think a very hopeful time uh, for new therapies for, for these uh, very debilitating diseases. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.